Hey, good afternoon. It's Alan Murabayashi with another episode of I Love Photography Live. You might be listening to us on our podcast that you found on iTunes.com by looking for I Love Photography, or you might be watching us live or watching us on demand at youtube.com slash photoshelter. As always, my co-host, hey Sarah. Hey Alan, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. I went to the eye doctor this morning. Uh-huh. And the eye doctor uh, put those drops in to dilate my eyes. Oh, God. Um, and other eye drops in to uh, uh, dull the reflex so that they could, like, do a pressure test against my eyeball. Yeah. I really feel like I have, like, an F1.4 lens in really bright <laughs> light, wide open, with with a bad autofocus system, because I, I can't quite see it. I... That's really too bad. Why are you not wearing sunglasses, Alan? Yeah, I, I should have considered that. I, I could have done that. I could, that would be a little weird for uh, the people that are watching the video. Uh, but if you're listening to the uh, the podcast, I guess it doesn't really make a difference. No, it, it doesn't make a difference as long as you know what links are up uh, at the right time. Then I think we should be fine. Yeah, you can get the links, by the way, at blog.photoshelter.com. Yeah. And you can always tweet at us at hashtag I love photo. Do that too. Um, spe- yeah, speaking of uh, lenses with f1.4, you know, I thought we would start this week. Sarah, I wrote a uh, an article a few weeks ago called "Why Do Photo Gear Reviews Have Crappy Sample Images," which was meant partially in jest, um, partially in truth, because I think it's true. And uh, the reason why I did that was because I was actually in the midst of reviewing a lens. Mm -hmm. And I got tired of seeing, particularly like on DP Review, um, like photos of the London Eye and photos of bicycles, you know, municipal bikes all all in a line showing kind of like depth of field. Because really, what does that have to do with anything? Nothing. So, yeah, nothing. (laughs) So, as you know, I wrote this thing. And you told me you laughed. You thought it was funny. Yeah. Uh, Petapixel came by and asked us whether they could republish it like they, they often do. We said yes. And then, of course, the internet being what the internet is, and everyone's smarter than me on the internet. Everybody has to chime in with their two cents about, I'm stupid, I've never done a lens review before, I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm unethical, like all, just like so much garbage, right? Yeah. Um, and, and in the piece, I did say, I, I understand that in some cases, when you have a new piece of gear, you only have it for a few hours. So that, that makes sense. Like you're shooting in the middle of, the, in the middle of London, that's why you have the London Eye, because that's how long you got the, the, the gear for. Mm-hmm. Well, so I wrote this piece. I took the feedback to heart, because I had this lens that I was testing for a month. And I took it back home to Hawaii. And uh, I got to thinking as I was writing the review of all these things that I wish I had shot. So I kept the lens for a few more days and, and kept shooting with it. And we uh, published that uh, review today about this Sigma 35mm f1.4 DGHSM. A wonderful, wonderful lens. Part of the fine art series. Uh, Part of the, the, art, the, the art, art series, series. Yeah. yeah. And... I got to tell you, I think uh, in the end, I mean, not to pat my own back, but I think <laughs> it came out pretty well. Uh, it I was did. Thinking, yeah, man, I was thinking about what things you really want to see when you're testing a lens. I think you want to see the lens wide open, mm-hmm. to see the vignetting, the bokeh. You want to see it uh, as sharp as it can, so in, in F8 or F16, in the hyperfocal range. Uh, you want to see the color fringing, and then you want to see some nice photos. I'm At sure. At the end of the day, we all just want to see some nice photos. You, you want know? to see some nice photos, right? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I thought it was a it, it was an instructive thing to go through. So, like many life experiences, it was uh, it was uh, it was well received on my part uh, in terms of like that was a good experience that changed my perception of life. So thank you to all of the people on Petapixel for pushing me harder. <laughs> you can find that review on blog.photoshelter.com. You know what? Let's talk about some photography because that will be infinitely more interesting than Let's what I it. learned today. <laughs> um, that, so feature shoot, which we've mentioned all the time, uh, just because I think they find 
some cool photography. You know, in the same, same way that the Lens Blog finds great photojournalism, Feature Shoot just finds like more art, personal project stuff, um, but, but very well uh, executed photography. And this one was no different. So this was a photographer named uh, Shema Salvans in Spain. And the project is called The Walking Game. And these are photos of prostitutes on the sides of the streets hanging out waiting for the next John. Topic, obviously, a little lascivious, a little controversial. But the photos, to me, are like really well composed, well exposed, interesting photos. Yeah, these are these are beautiful. They definitely ring a little bit creepy because you know he mentions that he didn't introduce himself to these women at all. He was just um, you know in the background acting as a, a surveyor uh, for the land <laughs> and then taking photos of them. Um, but I, I love here that the waiting seems infinite in these pictures and that's what I really love about them. Yeah, yeah. And you know, in contrast, last week we looked at Matt Mahon's images of prostitutes in Austin. Mm -hmm. And those, that was a situation where he would hire the girls for their time and then take a portrait within that hour, which were a lot more intimate in terms of, you know, the, the, the position of the woman in the frame was obviously much larger. They're staring right into the camera. Right. It shows that sense of interaction between them with, with Mike, with the photographer. Yeah. And so I think, you know, to, to your point about, like, they weren't aware, you, it, it kind of shows. But it's not, you know, I think he does the desolation and the waiting very, very well in these. Mm -hmm. Like so many art photos, it's like you could be in the most crowded place in the world, and yet there's one person in the frame. Right. So it's yeah. sort of masterful, you know? Yeah, and there's only a few where he chose where cars are actually passing by. Yeah. Otherwise, he, he chose that moment where there's just nothing going on. And it's also got that sort of filmy look to it, sort of like slightly desaturated, slightly flatter look to it. I don't know what he actually shot on. Um, but it, it does remind me a lot of stuff that you see in galleries, um, mm -hmm. you know, large format type prints. Uh, yeah, so I'd I like really to see this. these. Yeah, I'd like to yeah. see these printed big, especially with how small the subject is in the frame. Yeah, yeah, some nice stuff. Um, one of our favorite topics, or at least one of our recurring topics, is this guy, Terry <laughs> Richardson. <laughs> Terry Richardson. So I, I came obviously came across this article early on in the in the week, and when I read it, I mean it's a very long interview with him. Uh, I didn't realize mm -hmm. though that he's on the cover of New York Mag, which I don't know if you can flip the camera to me. I've yeah. got the shot here, uh, taken by Cass Bird, one Cass of Bird. our favorite. Yeah, one of our favorite photographers, who's definitely yep. one of the coolest. Um, I don't know how I feel about this picture that she's taken. I, I don't really like it. <laughs> it's pretty creepy looking. It's creepy looking. He looks sort of almost like a baby with his cradling his own head like that. Um, it's well, like you know, trying to make him look innocent. I don't know. What, what do you think? <laughs> in, in reading the article, uh, I thought that part of the, the, the deal with him is he's sort of like stunted growth like emotionally mm -hmm. we talk about the relationship with with his parents which was very very strained um, and all these weird sort of sexual interactions he had as a child and I think that he's like a child in this guy's body in a man's body and acting really not acting appropriately for his age um, and so whereas in the past I've defended Terry but I've, I've defended him because of people would poo-poo his photographic style Right. Which, you know, whether you like that or not, like my, my point has always been he, he owns that style. Like he, he had that raw, you know, flash right on the camera access uh, look that fashion people seem to love. Right. Um, right. But, but yeah, that, you read this stuff, it's, he's a creepy dude. He is. He's had a really dark, twisted past that I was unaware of. Um, and I hadn't really looked at a lot of his his past fine art work. I've only known his commercial work, but he was getting hired based off of his past personal work. And I just feel like a lot of creative directors or art directors that were doing the hiring at these big brands like H&M and 
you know, and GQ, things like that. They they should have known, looking back at his work, it's obvious that he is a little twisted. <laughs> to say yeah, the you least. know, I, I too hadn't seen that early work, which is very graphic and very sexual. Right. And, you it's, know, that's that's okay. I mean, New York Mag asks, like, is he a pervert or is he an artist? Yeah. Like, And you can be both. You can totally be both. Right. Just you can't be a professional and working with, you know, major companies and corporations and with young, young women uh, and putting them in danger. That That's where the line gets really blurry and messy. Yeah, I think when you have multiple women coming forward and saying, this guy tricked me and took advantage of me with the help of his assistant, so there's like a whole, like it's institutionalized over there, it seems like. Mm-hmm. I think that's the part that sort of bothers, bothers me. I, I agree. I mean, I think there, there are... Uh, perverted photographers and perverted people who want to get their photo taken and, and that works in some segments but but to your point like if you're working for a major brand and uh, these these brands and these magazines if the allegations are true and I think there, there must be some truth to it they've got to sort of look at their their motivation for hiring this guy continually yeah yeah agreed agreed Terry Richardson. But, yeah, but it's a it, it's a tough subject because you know you read his viewpoint. His viewpoint is I didn't coerce anyone. Nobody's saying I raped them. Nobody's saying that I broke a law. They're just saying like something happened, and I'm saying it was with their consent. So, uh, mm, yeah, it's dicey. It's it's, really it's a cool. little dicey, but given his track record and his yeah his twisted past, it. Uh, I don't think creative directors should be hiring him. <laughs> That's my opinion. All right, he can, he I, can I keep doing. That. He can, well, he can keep doing his his stuff. He should keep creating, but it needs to be with people that he knows personally and that are friends with him, and where it's under an an agreement of friendship, and that they also want to create the same type of art that he does, and then it's fine. <laughs> yeah, and I think the challenge is to 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 make sure that's commercially viable. Like if he said, I'm going to issue all commercial gigs from now on, and he goes back to doing more of the, quote, art photography that he was doing in the past, like do people want to buy a photo of his penis, you know? I I don't know. I don't know. I I don't. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, To something a little more wholesome, maybe. Right, right. Let's talk about something more wholesome. Yeah, let's. we can switch now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so there was a, a story, I'm going to say it's about three months ago, where somebody found a cache of photos, 445 photos to be exact, of this guy in a photo booth. And they were trying to figure out who is this guy and what's his story? Like, what was he like a, a repairman for the photo booth? Or was he just like, you know, really into selfies back in the day? And it turns out he was... Not into selfies. He was just part of it. It was like his business, the photo booth business. <laughs> so Rutgers University, New Jersey, Rutgers University uh, figured this out because his, I think it was his nephew that came forward and say, oh, yeah, that's my uncle. Um, so it's kind of cool. Um, and and, and I, the thing I like about this, you know, we, we've seen um, Noah Kalina every day. Yes, yes. Which, you can do easily because there's very little cost to digital and you can be anywhere and it's small and whatnot. This is kind of like Uncle Franklin is his name. Uncle Franklin every day, but not every day, but for 30 years. You can see the guy age. Yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing. He's prolific, to say the least, of how yeah. many how many photo booth pics he took of himself. Yeah, so and they they say at the end here, one question, however, remains. Why did Swantek keep all of those images of himself? Ah, be, maybe because it was cool. Yeah, it was cool before it was cool. And maybe, maybe he was just a, uh, maybe he was an artist on the inside, yearning for more from life. <laughs> 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 um, again, back to feature shoot. Yeah, not to, uh, not to keep going back to feature shoot, but you know, you go to a site, you see one series, and then there's all that stuff at the bottom that's like, did you see this thing? And and I I kept seeing some cool stuff over there. Um, this series is about portraits of Europeans who have abandoned civilization for the wilderness. Now, I don't know if you watch Mad Men. I do, yeah. Okay, well, uh, Roger's daughter 
Roger Sterling, who uh, yes, is, spoiler yeah, alert, Roger's daughter. Yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, uh, basically, goes off into like I don't know the cat skills or the Adirond cat, probably the cat skills. Um, in this last season, and joins like a hippie commune, which totally looked like this, and it the people totally like looked this. like this. <laughs> so, yeah, except for yeah. this is 2014, 2012, yeah. 2014. Uh, but but this in this photo, there is a rather large solar panel affixed to this shanty. Right. <laughs> They're up with the times. They yeah, they obviously know. still know. They know. So you know they have solar. It makes you wonder how much off the grid they're really living. I, I, I guess they're off the electrical grid because they have solar, but you think they have a smartphone somewhere stashed in there? Uh, well, I mean, by the looks of it, they do have a lot of random things within their little shacks and houses. Yeah. I would almost call them hoarders, maybe, if they lived in the in, civiliz in regular civilization, modern world. Um, but no. I think they're off the grid, Alan. I think that that's what they want. <laughs> So these these photos aren't all from one place; they're all over Europe, and and it's kind of a neat. It's kind of a neat series of images just to see, uh, you know, they aren't they aren't connected culturally in terms of they're all from the same country, but they are connected because they are rejecting modern life, and so that's sort of interesting to see how everyone's coping, and and what sort of technology they do have. Um, in this case, here's a little. Julian working on a bathtub. It looks more like a barbecue smoker that I would see in Texas <laughs> during, you know, barbecue season. Yeah, what's coming off of that bathtub? It's like smoke. Oh yeah, I don't know what he's doing Steam, there. Steam, I don't know. <laughs> nice images though. Square format, shooting six by six. Yeah. I'm guessing these aren't iPhone photos, although, well, I've been wrong. So who knows? But <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is six by six. <laughs> yeah. No, it looks like it looks like film to me. Um, so I saw this when it came out and I had a hard time believing this was true but Kanye West the hip hop impresario and his new wife Kim Kardashian their wedding photo turns out was the most liked photo ever on Instagram beating out Justin Bieber by a large large margin I'm glad I, just to be I'm glad that happened. Yeah, get that guy out of here. So here's the photo. <laughs> and the backstory, so it's currently at 2.29 million likes compared to 1.82 that Justin Bieber had. So it's like a wall of flowers and Kanye in a nice black slim fitting tuxedo and Kim in a lovely uh, wedding dress with a long train. They're kissing in front of this wall of flowers. And according to Kanye, they had hired Annie Leibovitz to shoot this photo, and she backed out at the last minute. That, Annie, what are you doing? That's unprofessional. It's unprofessional, but maybe it was like, okay, I'll give you a discount, but then I had a real commercial gig coming. But you know what? A lot of people backed out of this one. Jay-Z and Beyonce didn't show up. Oh, really? Biebs was invited. He didn't show up. Oh, my gosh. So, and, and I, heard, I heard it was sort of like a crazy disaster. But anyway, Kanye says in this interview that it took him like four days to put together this photo to make sure all of the elements are right. So here is the sort of philosophical question I have for you. Mm -hmm. In terms of popularity, obviously did very well. 2.29 million images, most liked ever. When you look at the quality of image, not so good. Like somebody used a cell phone or something like that to take this photo or like it, not a great <laughs> camera to this photo, right? Yeah, it could have easily... Four days. Right. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, like, the feet are cut off, and, you know, couldn't you pull back just, like, a foot? Yep. So, Does the light need to be yellow right there? No. Coming yeah. through? No. Yeah. So it's the question of, does quality and composition matter if the emotion and the point is getting across? And so let me flip it on you. Would Kanye put out an album recorded on a cassette tape I don't think so. <laughs> oh, that's I it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I was, I was looking it. for more analogies, but that's it. I think it'll be um, no, I mean, no, he, well, no, he definitely wouldn't. Uh, this photo got a ton of likes because it's Kimye, and of course it's going to. 
yeah. it has nothing to do with with how well the photo the was. The photo doing. itself. But even though Kanye claims that it is, he claims that it got that many likes because he wants to raise raise the bar. Everybody's Instagram bar is what he said. Oh, is but, that <laughs> raise the bar? Right? Yeah, he said I want to raise the bar in terms of the aesthetic on Instagram, but. Uh, you didn't. You didn't do that, Kanye. I'm sorry. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. <laughs> but you know what? I'm happy for him. He seems to be happy. It's all. Yeah. Good. It's all good. Uh, that ends the Kanye West and Kim Kardashian segment uh, this week. Why don't we go back to more photos? <laughs> more real photos. More real photos. <laughs> this was very cool. Um, just because the story behind it, and then you think about. The, the time period and that somebody went out to photograph it. Uh, the, the story is on um, MessyNessieChic.com uh, and it's called The Last Japanese Mermaids. And it talks about uh, uh, divers, female divers who are in charge of diving for oysters and abalone and a sea snail that produces pearls. So the women were chosen because they had higher body fat than men and they could stay in the cold water longer because there was no neoprene wetsuits back then and you couldn't wear cotton because it would just, they said uh, when you came out of the water, the cotton would just make you shiver. So it was easier just to have skin that dried very, very quickly. So in the mid 20th century, uh, Japanese photographer Iwasa Yoshiyuki returned to the fishing village where he grew up and he shot these photos of the women it's just trippy to see. So the women would hang out and dive topless because, again, they just wanted to have the least amount of clothing on them as possible to, to stay warm. And, like, that image, it's like a beautiful image. The light is wonderful. And you just would never see this anymore. No. Well, all the tourists came, what I read is all the tourists came through and were appalled, you yeah. know, that these women were not wearing tops. Yeah. And so then they had to change their, their outfits, which is so sad. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, uh, you know I'm from Hawaii. This is what happens when the missionaries came to Hawaii. All the, all the women were out there in, in the Hawaiian sun with no tops on, and the missionaries were like, oh, you must cover up. Oh, man. Um, and they gave them Gap t-shirts, so then everybody looked the same after that. <laughs> bunch of prudes. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of prudes. <laughs> but look at the, they're like, they're like uh, putting all the oysters into piles, and I don't know whether they're shucking stuff or not, but uh, it, it's cool too seeing the, so they're, they're all wearing shorts. After they got out of the water, they were wearing, like, I guess, like little loincloths while they were in the water, and when they came out of the water, they put on these shorts that are all sort of like, it looks like J. Crew's current season. Yeah, it does. They're <laughs> all different patterns. There's checkers, there's stripes, but they're all, they're all slightly coordinated, but they've all got their different style going. These are gorgeous. They're gorgeous, and I love that, you know, we talk about the angle from which you shoot the photo, and often in sports photography, you take a lower angle because you want to create sort of a upward to the subject to make them look heroic. And think about, this is, I don't know, mid-40s or something, mid-50s maybe, how many times were women being portrayed as being heroic or shot this way? Here's a woman with no top on, working because she can dive they, they said, I, I can't remember, ridiculous. They, they held their breath for two minutes. They went down like 18 times a day. Um, she's kind of a badass. Yeah. Yeah, she is a badass. <laughs> it's cool. I, I, I really liked these photos. Um, and it's, you know, again, just you see photos of uh, different things that you've never seen before, and I think... The, the historic photos because there just aren't a lot of them and, and surely uh, there's probably very few people that ever photograph this um, it's just a neat little slice of, of life going on there and of course you know this is very topical too a woman who's already topless breastfeeding her baby on the beach because obviously they had to bring their kids down to the beach I mean nowadays oh god you'd be, you couldn't even post this on Facebook <laughs> right Facebook would censor you <laughs> yeah they'd censor you oh lordy very cool images. Um, here you go. Yeah, I found this on Daylight. Um, Larry Clark. Talk about a, a, another co sort of controversial photographer, you know. Um, he is selling some of his personal photos in a gallery in London, the Simon Lee Gallery, and he's decided to 
to uh, price them down quite a bit. So you can get a 4x6 or a 5x7 for about $170. Um, and there's just going to be a stack of them, and you can go through and, and buy what you want. I wish I was going to London this summer to get some of that. But um, it makes you want to just jump on a plane and maybe... Yeah, and go pick one up. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, I mean, Larry Clark, his, his photos are, and his work, um, I don't know if you've seen the movie Kids, Alan, but, I mean, it's, it's controversial as well, but yes. he kind of stayed within his realm, or he got hired by, you know, magazines like Life, to photograph a little bit harder stuff. Counterculture. Yeah, the counterculture, exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. So anyway, if you're in London, go to the Simon Lee Gallery. You know, as much as we always want to poo-poo counterculture, it's the bad boy. You know, it's that, it's that whole bad boy genre that you can't help but just feel like it's very youthful time, and I think that's in part why kids, when it came out, kind of blew people away because it was so counterculture at the time. And so it's cool just to see like a stack. First of all, the prints, right? It's not like, hey, I have a bunch of flashcards. Right. Or come down for 170 bucks <laughs> in a flashcard. It's like right. here, here are actual prints from film that I've shot over in a drawer, 170 bucks. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of psyched to see all of these print sales going on in the 100 to $200 range. You know, we saw that with all the couple guys on Instagram mm -hmm. uh, selling I see it, stuff. Yeah, I see it come through my Tumblr feed, you know, quite a bit. Artists just trying to save up for that next lens or that next camera. And, you know, they're like, hey, I've got a flash print sale going on. And it, it, it reminds me of sort of the, the 20 by 200 ethic of, like, art for everybody. Here's stuff, you know, you have a blank wall or maybe you want something in your bathroom. You want to spend not too much money because who knows whether you're going to like the thing in like two years or not. So go out and spend a hundred bucks and put it up on your wall and have 700 days of lovely art. You know, that's not bad. No, it's not bad. And, and good art too, not like crappy stock photos. Yeah, crappy art. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, social media sent me this. Thank you, social media. It's an uh, Austrian photographer um, named Martin Klimas. And his shtick, he's kind of like a, I went to his website, and he's kind of a scientific-y photographer who uses a lot of acoustical triggers and stuff like that. So what he did was he found uh, these little porcelain Chinese figures, porcelain figures of like kung fu dudes or people fighting, and he would drop them from three feet onto the ground and use an acoustical trigger to fire a high-speed flash so he could stop the motion. And the result is, you have what kind of looks like people fighting but like breaking up too. It's like it, it's almost like a cool cartoon. Yeah, it made me think of video, a lot of fi those fighting video yeah. games. Yeah, yeah. But way cooler. I wonder if he set this up a lot just like a still, still life shot, like a, a product shot with light beneath it. Yeah. Hard, hard to say. I mean, you can, you can sort of see some of the specular reflections. So I think... Um, I think, like, in this image, for example, it looks like it's coming from high right from the camera axis. Um, and you can see the shadows on some of the pieces. Um, but, you know, it's a simple, it's a, a one-light simple setup against white seamless or, like, a small product background table. Right. And the little shards of porcelain, like, this one is cool. Like, the, in this one, two guys are kicking um, at each other's heads and, like, their feet are breaking off. Um... So uh, I continue to be, you know, for as much as people say, oh, we're, we're making the same movies and we're shooting the same stuff and there's no originality, this struck me as being pretty original. And check out his other work. Some cool, cool stuff on his website. Again, all the links that we're talking about today, you can get off of our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. Just look for I Love Photography. We do this every week. We do this every week. Every week. Over on Wired, uh, the bizarre world of fake vacation destinations. I uh, have Aust never heard of this fake destinations <laughs> thing, but it sounds incredible. Well, this is Austrian photographer Reiner Riedler, and he went all over the world and took photos of people 
at fake destination spots. Well, you you you, you kind of get the concept here in the U.S. because we have Las Vegas where they have a fake Eiffel Tower, That's and people true. go and get their photo taken from the Eiffel Tower. But there's places all over the world. We're looking at a photo of uh, tropical islands just outside of Berlin. It's an indoor. Uh, tropical island, but people are in their swimsuits and swimming in a pool. It's like a huge, like, backdrop. Um, but just kind of crazy and kooky, and a lot of this stuff is in uh, China. So here we are at the World Theme Park in Shenzhen, China, where they make a lot of the Apple stuff. And there's a pyramid and the Eiffel Tower in the same <laughs> spot. Only at a fake destination can you get those two things in one place. Yeah, I mean, if you really want to save money... And still right. see all the sites. You got to go to to these places. Right. Exactly. It's good money saver. It's just you know, quirky, quirky subjects, um, and nice photography. I mean, you know, think of how many photos get taken in all of these places. But this guy, as a series, comes up with some really nice work, and I think uh, it's a testament to his his good skills as a photographer. It's cool. I, I liked I like the uh, the pyramid and the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, I like the ones especially that show you know the the fakeness of it, like the ceiling fans <laughs> and all that in the outside in the outside room, basically. Yeah, you don't want to get actually fooled into thinking that the Eiffel Tower was moved next to the pyramids. Right. So Those seeing sort of some sort of prop, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's very helpful. <laughs> The uh, the last thing we have today for you is Matt Eich, friend of Photo Shelter, fantastic, fantastic photojournalist. There's a website called Medium. It was started by uh, I think it was started by uh, one of the the uh, Twitter guys. And and uh, you know it was you know they created Twitter and they said 140 characters is how you have to like tell your story there. And then almost the antithesis to that was Medium, which is long-form journalism. But it's crowdsourced long-form journalism. So anyone can, can sign up to be a writer for Medium if, obviously, you don't care about getting paid and whatnot. And then the stories on there are sort of upvoted, and then they end up on the Medium homepage uh, in different categories, et cetera. Well, Matt wrote a story called How to Make a Family Portrait. And it's not what you think. It's actually about how he unexpectedly had a kid with his wife as teenagers. And it goes through and he said, uh, listen, I'm going to document everything. And of course, being a photographer, he's going to take photos. But unlike most dad or mom photographers, Matt's a really good photographer. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so seeing some of these images, uh, uh, you know, here was when his wife told her parents that she was pregnant at the age of 19 or something like that. And just sort of poignant, tender moments. I think there's like a lot of concern that you see on the faces of her parents. And I think concern in her own body language, like, oh my God, what am I doing? And yeah, I with her know, hands on her face in that yeah. first shot. Yeah, he talked, never, he talked to her about, I'm going to take photos, and then he immediately took the photo right after she told him <laughs> I'm pregnant. Yeah. Like, All right, well, let's get started. Let's get started documenting this. And, you know, when you do photojournalism, a lot of, a lot of uh, the success of the story is about access and intimacy with the subject. And obviously, you, you'd be hard-pressed this if you didn't really, really work at it. Or it was your own. The photo of his wife, very pregnant, naked, next to the side of a bed. Um, lovely, lovely photo. But can you imagine, you know, being the guy from the local newspaper and walking in and being like, "Hey, we want this story on your pregnancy." <laughs> like you would not get that photo. No. This one's great. Here's a, a photo of his wife looking a little sullen, maybe a little tired, and then there's a bag from like I don't know. American Eagle. Definitely looks like American Eagle. Right? With a very happy face. <laughs> on Just an incredible juxtaposition of, of stuff. And then and it, born. Yeah, and what's, what's great about him putting this together now, I mean, it's been years. They have a, another child um, yeah. now. And you can see the progression of his work. You know, just the, the images get better and better with time as he's grown. Yeah, yeah. And and you must think like how many frames did he take to get to this sort of edit? 
Um, yeah, he, is, he'll probably, you know, his whole life be going back to this body of, of work and re-editing and refiguring, you know. I feel like that's sort of a long life-term yeah. project. And they had a second baby, so you go through the second baby. This this photo cracked me up. <laughs> so it's his wife with two manual breast pump, or two breast pumps, one on each breast, and then their little daughter with no shirt on, which I'm sure will cause some controversy for somebody. <laughs> um, but again, like a lot of a lot of the the images that he has here, you know, we talked about the sullen face and the happy face are are about juxtaposition. Um, and I think this is just another case of like a little kid topless and the mom topless doing two very different things that are indicative of the different places that they are in their lives. So it's a there it's a lovely set of photos and I think that the the story behind it is even lovelier. Yeah, beautiful work, Matt. Yeah. And that's that's you know, we always try to end with some a nice story and some nice photography. And I think we did, Matt. Matt Aish. Wonderful. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sad I had to send that lens back to Sigma. Yeah. And, uh, the first uh, comment that we got on the blog um, was from Pick Seshu, another photo blogger, who said he got that lens, which normally retails for 700 or $800. He got it as an Amazon deal for 600 Wow. He said, Alan, you gotta you gotta make sure you're getting these these he notifications. Needs, uh yeah, he needs to link us ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well that was that was long ago and he's loving that lens and yeah, maybe I'll you know, if only I hadn't bought all this other crap that I don't use, like <laughs> my Instax printer, which I I, I was just about to say. <laughs> <laughs> the hey, if anybody printer. out there yeah, if anybody out there wants the Fuji Instax as a printer, uh, I will trade you for a Sigma 35 millimeter f1.4 lens, um, and I, I will sign it, which will <laughs> increase the value. Of the piece. Great. Well, we're doing this on a, a, a Thursday this week. The normal day is Friday. Unfortunately, I'm flying out uh, tomorrow for a wedding in California, so maybe I'll have some nice uh, wedding photos to share with you next week. I hope so. But Sarah, have a good uh, weekend. Thank you. You too, Alan. And to everyone out there in I Love Photography land, thanks for joining us once again. For Sarah Jacobs, this is Alan Robayashi. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.